Hey everyone, before we open today's file, please make sure to follow us on Instagram at d.s.radio where you can find all the images that go along with today's case. You can drop us an email at contact.dsradio at gmail.com. You can find all of our socials in the Linktree bio on our Instagram profile, including links to merch. If you're feeling especially generous, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation radio, where you can get access to our exclusive Instagram page and make suggestions for upcoming episode topics that you would like us to cover. Speaking of Patreon, thanks to our Patreons, Riff Cult, Cropley Crab, Cash Broadus, Raspberry Jr., Jason R. Nelson, Creepy Paper, Jamie Suit, Michael Laughlin, Lindsay Keller, Mike Wright, Gria Weaver, Kelsey Carithers, Linz Gibbon, Drake Holvig, Only Child, Michael M, Wesley Akers, Riaz K, Emily Medeiros, Pip, Heather Wynn, Graves, Devin Sweatshirt, The Ordained Sinister Minister, and Philip Hoffman. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Dystopian Simulation Radio. I'm your world heavyweight champion of peculiar podcasting, Chris, and this is the Cruiserweight of Chaos, Lens. Thank you, Chris. That was a delightful introduction. (laughs) That's all right. How are you doing? Well, I'm a lot better now that I'm not in an airport for 18 plus hours in the Netherlands, Chris. Yeah, I I saw on your Instagram that you went on holiday to an airport. Yeah, um, not intentionally, but I think the engines blew up before we uh, tried to take off or, you know, as they tried to frame it. Um, a bird flew into the engine, conspiracy theory for sure. But um, mm. yeah, we got stranded in Schiphol Airport and I was there for like 15 plus hours. It was 18 for me, a bit less for some others, but um, I got adopted by some Lovely Australians, shout out to the Australian family, as well as after that, um, ITV newsreader Ian Payne and his wife, and a lovely Hungarian girl, so shout out to those guys too. (laughs) Uh, I don't know who Ian Payne is, but he sounds like he's about to go on a a vengeful quest through New York City. (laughs) He's um, an ITV newsreader, very, very lovely man, (laughs) and hilarious. (laughs) <laughs> do you think that it's anything to do with our coverage of the Denver airport? Definitely, 100%. I mean, they knew I was there and they just wanted to trap me there. And I don't know why, but there's definitely a conspiracy to uncover here, Chris. There was no birds in that engine and I would love to see that report. I think we were abducted by aliens. Lizard people. <laughs> yeah, 100%. There's lizard people in Schiphol and in Denver. It's, it all connects together. Yes. Also, we were completely abandoned by all staff Aww. and left in this airport at night time. And it was kind of horrific. KLM? Yeah. I used to love KLM. Not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I've had some experiences recently with KLM um, and uh, I don't like you anymore, KLM. Thank you. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't like them either now. I used to love them. Silver member, no. you know, flying with them all the time, always singing their praises. And now... No, horrible. Hate you. Sort your shit out, man. <laughs> Anyways, Chris, how are you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm pretty good. I haven't been trapped in, in any airport um, as of yet. Anyway, <laughs> but it's uh, it's all good over this way. But uh, you know what? I'm better than usual because we've got some news. Oh, do we? Oh. Now, hold your horses, folks. 
Normally, this is where we'd be telling you to follow us on Instagram at d.s.radio and subscribe to our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation radio. And maybe I just did that, (laughs) but ignore that small fact for now. Lens, we do have an exciting announcement, don't we? Yeah, I'm excited. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talk. You do. Ooh. We have a merch store. <gasps> yes, we do. Yay. Ooh. So lots of people have been asking us to put together a, a, a merch store with some of our designs on. And I'm really happy to say that we are ready to launch it now with this particular episode. So if you fancy some cool designs, I'm going to tell you what they are in just a second. You can head over to tpublic.com forward slash stores forward slash dystopian dash simulation dash radio and if that's too long and it probably is what you can do is go to the link tree in our instagram bio and we will have a link directly to there you can browse all the designs that we have and we have four of them up right now Ooh, and firstly we've got our podcast logo with all kinds of spooky creatures and our cartoon faces. You can even get this design in a super cool double-sided t-shirt, Chris. Oh, hell yeah. Next up, we've got our X-Files-inspired design. If you want everyone to call you spooky, but in a cool, loving way. (laughs) I hate you, Chris. Next up, we have a drain the lock design so you can show your support for my mission to drain Loch Ness to answer once and for all if Nessie is down there or not (laughs) and of course your part two on Nessie is going to be coming very soon but before we talk about that let's just uh, address the fourth one and this one might be my favorite you can get our alien love inspired design always watching featuring a cooked mantis (laughs) Get it on a coffee tumbler to talk about it with. <laughs> that would certainly um, be a good conversation point, Chris, with um, complete strangers. So you can find the designs on T-shirts, stickers, mugs, tumblers, totes, and so much more. So if you want to support us here at DSR, head over to our T Public page and see what wares we have on offer. Or you can just go to our Instagram bio. It's probably the easiest way to do it. Now, we don't control the prices over there. But they do seem to be pretty reasonable and worldwide shipping is on offer. And it seems to be roughly the same cost on delivery wherever you are. It's T Public. It's a pretty trusted name out there. So you can buy with confidence. But if you've got any questions, they answer them all in an FAQ. Ooh, and if you happen to see Chris in public, he may just open his large trench coat and sell you things directly from his body. <laughs> <laughs> It's a weird way of putting it, but yes, okay. <laughs> Gotta make maybe. ends meet, Chris. <laughs> so, Linz, uh, just as a reminder, why don't you just tell the listeners where they can find the images for today's episode? So, all the visuals to go along with today's episode can be found at Instagram at d.s.radio, Chris. And they can sign up to our Patreon. Which is patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation radio. And you do get lots of goodies if you come along with the Patreon. We've just sent out Patreon packs, which are starting to land around the world. Right now, people got some uh, cool stickers, a handwritten note, and some various other bits and bobs, and there will be more of those to come in the coming months as well. But of course, the main thing that you get access to is our exclusive Instagram Patreon page, which is only for our Patreons, and that lens is... Ah, that would be DSR Friend Club, Chris. (laughs) That's right. You do need to be a Patreon to get access. So uh, if you are and you've requested access, we haven't let you in. Just let us know, however you want to, like Instagram, Facebook, Patreon. Just tell us. It's just because we don't recognize your username to your actual name, potentially. Um, and if you've requested access, but you're not a Patreon, hey, we're on to you. <laughs> but just sign up for as little as a pound, one pound, and you can see all of the goodness over there. And you can message us to your heart's content. <laughs> you certainly can do about anything you want and oh my god some of you do uh, but <laughs> you please, really no, do <laughs> <laughs> we love it we absolutely love it um no i've got a really interesting file to present to you today ladies but before we do i did want to cover just a little bit of uh news oh. that we have out there in the world and i don't know if you heard this but have you heard that there may be a reboot of the x files on the way I did hear that, and I think I heard it from um, Michael of Septembrio, of course. 
Well, he is right. Uh, we both had a very lengthy conversation about it uh, because the original creator of the X-Files, Chris Carter, said in a recent interview that I just spoke to a young man, Ryan Coogler, who is going to remount the X-Files with a diverse cast. So he's got his work cut out for him because we covered so much territory. <laughs> and Lens, let me tell you, I have feelings about this. But what do you think first? What does he mean, a diverse cast? That's the only information that you've given me there. <laughs> Reptilians, perhaps? Um... Reptilians, yeah, the more... <laughs> no, but Ryan Coogler, most famous for directing Creed and both Black Panther films. Diverse cast in terms of the, the ethnicities and so on who may be taking part in it, rather than just white people everywhere. Oh, well, doesn't give me much to go on in terms of plot and style, but sounds lovely. <laughs> mm. um, I, is there anything else that we can add to that? Like No. That is that is it. Um, okay. I want more X Files. Oh yeah, and absolutely fine with, with a diverse cast and everything else. Absolutely no worries at all. And as I just mentioned, Ryan Coogler does have some pedigree to his name. Um, obviously, the biggest things having directed being Black Panther and Creed. Not very supernatural. I mean, kind of supernatural, mm. but not not a. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. I guess I I don't know what I hoped for really. Um, I never really thought they would mm. be a reboot, but um. Maybe, I don't know, can't get excited yet. Not really a lot of information there for me to be like, oh my God, really? Mm. Other than the concept that there will be more X-Files. But um, yeah, I guess I'll have to, to um, keep my That's eyes it. peeled. I, w- I want more X-Files. Yeah. But I don't think I'm ready to say goodbye to Mulder and Scully, man. No, no. Like, I, I don't know, like maybe we're being precious about it, but... um. I, don't know. I mean, if it is going to have a more diverse cast, it should star either Denzel Washington or Wesley Snipes. Shut up. <laughs> Do you want to tell the story? Fine. That joke. <laughs> no, but what I will say is a lot of you did not realize that I mixed two actors up and that, that makes you bad people. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the... Um, I do have an idea. I do have an idea that is going to make this a surefire hit. Mm-hmm. Okay. So just stick with me. Okay. Okay. Pedro Pascal is so hot right now. So hot right now, Chris. Um, And he is a diverse actor to step into the role of Agent Mulder. uh, And it would be a guaranteed hit. Yeah. I mean, as long as people know that it's Pedro, they will watch. I mean, just look at, uh, you know, The Last of Us that he was just in. And of course, The Mandalorian. I mean, we don't even see his face in most episodes. Mm. So... I would propose, just to make sure that everyone is absolutely sure that he is starring in it, we insert his name into the title. So what I'd propose is that we change the name from the X-Files to the Pedrofi... Uh, uh, um, <laughs> oh. oh, shit. I've just realized what I've done there, Linz. Oh, no. Uh, well... <laughs> that's, a, that's a very different television show. Yeah, I mean, I did hear that To Catch a Predator was continuing online in some form but um i think it's always continuing online (laughs) no that's not funny i meant like oh no (laughs) i meant like he doesn't do it on tv anymore he does it on youtube oh chris why did you have to like bring us into such an awkward segment (laughs) well you could have just said they're gonna reboot the X Files, like the end let's carry on but now we're talking about something i don't want to be I was going to say touch it. Oh, for fuck's sake. This well, look, speaking of files, but with, a, with an F, not with a PH, um, the, the X-Files. I have a doozy of an X-File for you today on dystopian simulation radio. Mm-hmm. Now, Lens, just a few general questions. Have you ever seen an alien? I suppose you don't know if you've seen an alien because I've seen a lot of Nordics, but were they Nordics? Who knows? But you've never seen like a little green man? No, I don't think so. I mean, I don't have the best memory. a lot in Shields, but you've never seen that. <laughs> On a Friday night. <laughs> have you ever seen an alien with multiple other witnesses also viewing this at the same time? No, can't say I have, no. Have you ever held fort while extraterrestrials attacked your farm and you had to shoot your way out of Dodge? <laughs> no, I think I've had a couple of dreams like that. <laughs> mm. But uh, not, not in real life. Really? Okay, surprising. It's quite common. So I guess, well, listen on to this story. And many thanks to Ellie Bergen for the suggestion of this episode. Uh, That actually jogged my memory 
about it, reading about this particular case in a UFO book that I had when I was a child. Ooh. But Linz, now let's travel back to the exotic land of Christian County, Kentucky. Christian County. Sorry, I just can't believe that's a real county name. Love it. Mm, it it's a big Muslim area. <laughs> in the two towns of Kelly and Hopkins. <gasps> Just three hours and 42 minutes from where the colonel blended together seven herbs and spices. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't really work in a British accent, that does it. Herbs and spices. <laughs> you are so silly. Right, hold on. Can I, can I just direct you? And, and please, everybody who's listening to this, do the same thing as me, okay? I'd like you to type in on Google, KFC Twitter. Just look up at the followers. Yeah, there's quite a lot of people following. But then look just to the side of it. How, there's, how many people do KFC follow? 11 following. <laughs> oh my God, Chris, that is too funny. <laughs> <laughs> they only follow a blend of herbs and spices. They really do. The spices. <laughs> The Spices being the Spice Girls and several random people called Herb. Yeah, we have Emma Bunton, Melanie C, Victoria Beckham, and then a bunch of people called Herb. <laughs> Herbert Jones, we've got a uh, Herb Scribner, Herb J. Wesson Jr. <laughs> there you go, folks. You see, we not only entertain, we also educate. I swear to God, that is so funny. I can't believe that's real. <laughs> So from that bombshell, let's go to the Hopkinsville police station on August 21st, 1955. Everything was going as normal in this small rural area of Kentucky. A few drunks had been locked up to sober up overnight. The receptionist had just laid out a buffet of coffee and donuts for the overnight force. And an unnamed deputy was just starting his shift. Let's call him Pete. Pete was looking over the paperwork for those in the cells when suddenly the doors flew open and three tiny creatures entered the police station. These creatures are commonly known as children. Oh. <laughs> I was like, I know nothing about this case, but this is not how I thought it went. <laughs> they were screaming something about silver men, and they were then followed by five older children known as adults. <laughs> Pete tried to settle the mob down and find out just what it was they wanted to report. And it turned out it was the first and only time the precinct would report a four-hour siege with little green men. Okay. <laughs> Pete listened to their story and launched an investigation. Hold on a finger-licking second, though. What exactly happened up there on that Kentucky ranch? And when I say ranch, I mean farmhouse. Kelly itself is apparently more of a collection of homes than a a real town, relying on nearby Hopkinsville for most necessities. Kelly is mainly a rural farming community with green fields as far as the eye can see. Glennie Langford had rented the farmhouse and lived there with her children, Lonnie, Charlton and Mary, as well as two sons from a previous marriage. Elmer Lucky Sutton, John Charlie J.C. Sutton and their respective wives Vera and Aline, Aline's brother O.P. Baker, and Billy Ray Taylor and his wife June were also there. The Taylors were reportedly visiting Lucky and Vera Sutton, who they sometimes worked with in their jobs on the carnival circuit. Now these two clans, the Suttons and the Taylors, were dining one night in the farmhouse. Now personally, when I hear farmhouse, I envision quite a large home. But in this case, it was actually a three-room domicile which was reportedly in a state of disrepair. Unpainted walls, with no connected water, no television, no radio, no TV, and also, weirdly reported as a fact, no books. Yeah, that is a strange fact. <laughs> a sparse existence, to say the least. There was a well on site, and remember, these were the days before the ring, so it was not actually creepy to have a well nearby you. I'm sure it was, Chris. I'm sure it was for many other reasons. <laughs> Don't like your wife? Get a new one. <laughs> <laughs> well, after eating dinner that night, a 21-year-old Billy Ray Taylor went up the hill to fetch a pail of water, but was surprised to see a bright flash in the sky. 
baffled, BRT as I know him, watched as a silvery craft became visible, hover over the farmhouse before zipping away and landing behind the tree line. Taylor said the UFO was real brat with an exhaust all the colors of a rainbow. <laughs> Why was he so sassy? <laughs> I don't know, but maybe all these colors, maybe they were all colors Sam. <gasps> Check it out in the archives. But anyway, at this news, Billy Way rushed home with the water and told tale of his UFO encounter to the other residents of the farm, who were playing a game of cards at the time. Taking it to be just a prank, bro, they all laughed off the tail of this unexpected light in the sky. Silly Billy. Well, roughly half an hour later, the smile would be wiped off their smug faces. Off in the distance, the family began to hear the non-stop barking of a dog. Odd noises were observed, and they seemed to be getting closer to the home. Ooh. Billy Ray had enough and convinced Lucky Sutton to investigate outside with him. So the pair trekked out to the well and found absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so Lucky called Billy a few choice words, and then just as the pair were starting to head back to the house, suddenly this small gentleman appeared from the darkness. And Linz, would you please be so kind as to describe this to the Oh viewers? God, there's a picture. Okay. Ah, now I am familiar with this little fella. So it says here, figure 10, little man, as described by Elma Sutton, J.C. Sutton, and O.P. Baker, drawn by Andrew Bud Ledwith. So he is two and a half to three and a half feet. Don't know what sex he is. Um, <laughs> he's very cute. He has a mm. big round head, a long line for a mouth, and kind he looks kind of batish, to be honest with you, like a big large bat. He has eyes that look like the way they're drawn, it kind of looks like a dial on an old appliance. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, right. a, a big round head, little bat like little crispy bacon bat ears. And then he's got kind of um Got some pecs on him, I'll tell you that. Broad at the shoulders, thin at the waist, Chris. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> For those who don't understand why Chris is dying in the background, it's because that was the description of the Somerton Man, an episode that we had to record 5,000 times because it kept, not, um, it kept failing. But we did record it, so look it up in the archives, and it has been solved. Woohoo. Anyway, this little guy is um, broad at the shoulders, thin at the waist. He's got some webbed. His arms are very long and they hang all the way to his little skinny ankles. Um, he's only got definition on the top half of his body, that he's just kind of smooth and skinny as it goes down. Um, yeah, it says here, ears swept back, extended quite a bit above the crown of the head. Eyes, yellow sender, white rim about six inches apart, glowing. Okay. Um... The mouth, a thin line, but not sure that there was a mouth. So that's just a little guesstimate there. Could have just made that up. That's always great in a witness report. Um, body, powerful above waist, muscles clearly seen, below waist, thin and spindly. Almost no shape to legs, stick-like. I, I agree with that. Hands, oversized talons. Okay, they're supposed to be talons. Two or three inches long, webbing between the fingers, starting about the knuckle above the talons. Feet, not seen or not noted. And then he signed it there. Bud's done his little signature at the bottom. He knew that this was going to be... He's very proud. Yeah, I mean, it's good drawing. He drew the grass pretty realistically and the rest of it not really. Yeah. <laughs> you did miss out my favorite detail of the entire thing, which is um, just behind the side profile ear. <laughs> Neck, non. <laughs> Nose, non. One man stated very strongly that there was none. There was no nose, I tell you. <laughs> or neck. My dog has no nose. How does he smell? Awful. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for that very thorough description. Here's 
a description I prepared. So firstly, this little dude is Hench. He's like Rey Mysterio in 2004. He's built oh, all up sick. top, baby. It, it's an upper body business. Uh, his head is shaped like an egg and he has nipples for eyes. He has <laughs> no neck and he has the mouth of a Canadian from South Park. His arms are creepily long <laughs> to the point where knuckle dragger would be a compliment and his feet are obscured by grass. But some people said that the creatures almost floated rather than walked. So maybe that's why. Ooh, nubs. I like it. So Linz, yes. you meet Gary the Goblin here outside your farmhouse on an evening. How would you react? Uh, this might be unconventional, but kind of want to hug him. He's so cute. He's like a little Batman. Well. <laughs> and he's little. He is. <laughs> Lucky and Billy Ray ran back to the porch, grabbed themselves a gun, and started blasting. Ah. See, if, that, if this was England, you wouldn't have that choice. You'd be like, I'm either going to hug him or knife him. <laughs> or both, bro. Try me. <laughs> yeah. We'll see how the hug goes and we'll go from there. I was going to say shank, but it sounded a bit too close to something else. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Lucky was armed with a 12-gauge shotgun and Billy with a 22 rifle. Yeehaw. The creature continued on towards them at the back of the house as they fired at it, raising its arms in the air, oh. almost in an act of surrender See? as it floated ever closer. Oh, he wanted a hug. That is so evil. He would see that little Batman and just go, I'm going to kill it. <laughs> well, they didn't have any books, well, so maybe they were just living in fear. <laughs> <laughs> As the creature continued towards them, the men cocked, locked, and loaded, and rained down bullets on the creature. Mm. And in a scene from The Matrix, the creature, and I quote, did a flip. <laughs> like Baby Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> After doing a flip, this alien then grabbed a skateboard that was nearby and hit downright circle to pull off a sick 360 Christ air on a nearby halfpipe. <laughs> The boys, of course, were so impressed that they laid down their arms and took up the boards, and that's how the Olympics accepted skateboarding as a legitimate <laughs> sport. The, the, I'm, of course, I'm joking, but the alien doing a flip does bring up an interesting part of its anatomy. It was reportedly very slow when using its legs, but lightning fast when using its arms, mm. which would account for this Danny DeVito-sized goblin with the upper body of Arnie. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it could be possible that these legs are just there for holding up the body as opposed to motion, like a Sabutio figure. <laughs> these creatures seem to be much more nimble on their hands. The men retreated then into the house, and at the sound of gunfire, the others had begun to take the situation a whole lot more seriously. The children were hidden, and the house locked down. As the adults listened to the fading odd sounds outside, they thought they were in the clear. But then suddenly, an alien head popped up at the living room door. <gasps> much like Stan Romanek. Yeah, alien boo. <laughs> yeah. But possibly not a polystyrene head. <laughs> so guess what these boys did at this peeping Tom? Shot him through the glass. They shot the shit out of it through the glass. Yes! <laughs> That's like a horror movie. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Having had just about enough of this gosh darn alien shit, <laughs> Lucky and Billy Ray headed outside, and they saw nothing. It was eerily quiet. But suddenly, a hand grabbed Billy Ray's hair from the roof. <gasps> oh my god. Lucky turned around, and you guessed it, started blasting. <laughs> How many bullets did they have? They didn't have to reload. <laughs> no, it's like a video game, they just keep going. <laughs> they had like AKs or something. Like, I thought they had shotguns and rifles, right? So, okay, yeah, sure. It was at this point that they noticed that the bullets were making a metallic sound <gasps> when hitting this extraterrestrial threat. Not a squishy, fleshy sound. And the aliens seemed impervious to our human weapons and just kept flipping their way around out of the way. Mm. The boys then noticed that one was sitting in a tree, and I quote, Coming right for us! So they unloaded <laughs> a few rounds at the creature. And this creature then appeared to float down to the ground before disappearing into the night. Ooh. 
very spiritual, these little Batmen, aren't they? They are. But, but it's like no description I've ever heard before, which is something that we're going to come to a little bit later. Mm. The men, though, realized that there was a moment of calm, but they sensed that there was more henshi mork boys out there <laughs> heading towards them. So they made cover in the house. Everything was calm before they saw a set of glowing eyes at the living room window. Oh, gosh. Bang, bang. They shot twice at the creature, taking out both panes of glass. Because with Stafe Style UK's windows, you buy one, you get one free. I said you buy one, you get one free. <laughs> 95% of our audience have got no idea what that reference is to. <laughs> and I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. You, have, you might have to be British to get that joke. <laughs> Sorry, American audience, who happens to be the biggest audience we have. <laughs> <laughs> now the house was exposed, so they retreated deeper into the house, and the uh, the men noticed that another one of the beasts was in a tree, which they shot at and refused to fall down after being shot and just, again, floated away ethereally into the distance. More creatures approached, and in order to get a better look at them, somebody switched on a light. And this was a quite literal light bulb moment. <laughs> the alien creatures seemed to be repelled by light and mm. promptly took off into the woods. Ooh, so you can shoot them, but don't you dare turn on a light. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's no light on the planet they come from, <gasps> even though there was a rainbow light on the back of their ship. But they do look like bats, so they were like... <laughs> And like ran away, scattered into the night. Did you like that sound effect? I did. It's it <laughs> horrific to my ears. Um, <laughs> after that, then, every light in the house was switched on. And the creatures never attempted to enter the house, but did occasionally peep into the windows and walk around on the roof. Ooh, why do aliens always do that? Because they're just pests, man. It's creepy, though. It's like... They all do it, no matter the species, unless they're reptilians and then they happen to be a bit more violent. Mm. Mm. I guess these little guys are less advanced and they're just like, hello, and then we shoot them and they're like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, the matriarch of the family, Glennie Langford, had been praying during this whole incident and just being a, you know, a super help against this alien threat and eventually suggested that the creatures had not actually tried to hurt anybody. And our weapons don't actually seem to be doing any harm to them. So maybe after four hours of this ordeal, we could just safely make an escape. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the ambush didn't go to plan. The weapons aren't working. You've got no windows, probably getting a bit cold. Might be a yeah. good idea to either get the, get the frick out or wait until sunrise, whichever seems to make more sense. Well, running out of patience and more tangibly bullets, the boys agreed, and the whole clan piled into their cars. And suddenly, now we're back at the beginning of our story, with Pete the PC starting his shift and filing a report of an alien siege at a farmhouse up the road. It's going to be a long-ass shift, Pete, so you better get that pot coffee pot of brewing. <laughs> the police reported that the men told tale of fighting little silver men. The cops certainly didn't believe the family, but they did believe that there was something that had spooked them and shots had been fired. Chief Russell Grenwell, four policemen, including some military police from a nearby base, a journalist, a photographer, and several members of the public, formed a crew that was dispatched to investigate the farm. Not much was going on there, was it? Everyone was like, assemble! <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the officers recounted that on the way, he saw loud meteors in the sky as the car approached the farm, likening it to gunfire and travelling away from the site. Ooh. When they arrived, the posse scoured the farm for signs of alien life and for the evidence of the war zone expected. And they did find a cat. Aww. <laughs> A cat whose tail was accidentally stepped on and literally caused the officers to fire upon each other. <laughs> the 
they were in such a state of fear from these little aliens. <laughs> oh, poor farm cats. Broken windows and shells were found, although not as many as the boxes of ammunition that have been reported about this story. It has been greatly overblown later in life how many shots were fired. They did find some patches of iridescent markings, and Ooh. supposedly where the family reported some of the shooting occurred, and deeper into the woods, near the fence, some reports claim they found a patch of glowing green. Although <gasps> when investigated the next day, during daylight, it had disappeared. Oh, maybe it was like a glow stick. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a ra- there's just a rave going on <laughs> yeah, it's in the nearby. <laughs> the iridescent patches can probably be chalked up to water on the grass or some other liquid. Remember, Billy Ray was carrying water as he ran towards the house originally. Yeah, but but iridescent. Mm, it could be a different type of liquid. You don't know. I mean, mm. there, there's no pictures of this. I guess when you mix like oil and water, you get that kind of rainbowy, shimmery thing. Exactly. Or it could have been alcohol or it could have been mm. anything, uh, some kind of other liquid that happened to be spilled. And you might never think anything of it at all. But because there's been a, a report of the alien siege, you put two and two together and you're at Alpha Centauri. <laughs> that green patch, though, is much more interesting but it is consistent with a bioluminescent fungus that grows in the area. Take a look at this. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. That's so beautiful. Yeah, we just have a patch of fungus, I guess, on a tree branch, and it's glowing. Like it's like sci-fi glowing. It's really, really, really cool. I love that. That would make a great lamp. Very, uh... (laughs) Very good on energy saving. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe we will have to do this with the amount my bill's going up. <laughs> yeah, just cover our homes in this fungus and hope that our lungs survive it. <laughs> now, this is foxfire, as it's colloquially known, Ooh. and mostly glows at night. Mostly. mostly. <laughs> so if you went back during the day, you're not going to see it because it will only glow at night. So if the officers, after finding nothing of any real note, went home and the family decided to return to the house. They were nervous but happy that the creatures must have vacated the area as police had thoroughly searched the area and found nothing. Smash cut to Glenny Yankford awaking from a light sleep to find one of the creatures peeping in at her bedroom window. God damn it. Just purving away. <laughs> like in a tree or hovering? <laughs> And I guess it isn't just mantises that are always watching. So she screamed and the boys came to her aid and the light once again repelled the creature into the darkness. But this was the last the family would ever claim to have seen these little silver men. Oh, but I love them. But maybe we can find them. Let's investigate further. And much like in our eternally referenced first episode, the Robert Taylor incident, This case was investigated by the police. Therefore, we have a police report and evidence. Oh, yes. I was about to ask for that, but I I thought you'd come up with it. (laughs) Now, one thing that was never doubted throughout the whole investigation is that the family were terrified and believed what they were saying. It wasn't a simple hoax. Heart rates were measured at panicked levels, and it was noted that there was a high level of corroboration between the statements. So, Linz, would you like to take a look at Glenny Langford's witness statement? Definitely, Chris. Okay. Ooh, I see some redacted portions here. So, my name is Redacted, age 50, and I live at Redacted, Hopkinsville, Route 6, Kentucky. On Sunday night, August 21st, 55, at about 10.30 p.m., I was walking through the hallway, which is located in the middle of my house, and I looked out the back door, slash south, and saw a bright silver object about two and a half feet tall appearing round. I became excited and did not look at it long enough to see if it had any eyes or move. I was about 15 or 20 feet from it. I fell backward, and then I was carried into the bedroom. 
my sons, redacted, age 25, and his wife, redacted, age 29, redacted, age 21, and his wife, redacted, age 27, and their friends, redacted, age 21, and his wife, redacted, 18, were all in the house and saw this little man that looked like a monkey. Redacted was a really popular name in Kentucky, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a mouthful to try and read as well. You're like, who in the, who in the what? <laughs> So, at about 3.30 a.m., I was in my bedroom and looked out the north window and saw a small silver shining object, around two and a half feet tall, that had its hands on the screen looking in. I called for my sons and they shot at it and left. I was about 60 feet from it at this time. I did not see it anymore. I have read the above statement and it is true to the best of my knowledge and belief. Witness, S. John E. Albert certified true copy. And then it's signed, Charles N. Kirk, first lieutenant, USAF. And that's about it. How do you think people reacted to this story at the time? Well, so he said, we were all in the house and saw uh, this little man that looked like a monkey. Um... I'm guessing people probably laugh their asses off or Well I I couldn't tell you. It's I mean it's funny to me now. I'm not sure how people reacted to it back then. Maybe they were more fearful of little monkey men. Ay 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 <laughs> <laughs> Well remember we are talking about nineteen fifty five, so we're only what, seven years removed? Uh, eight years removed from a Roswell incident. So this is mm. still a sort of new thing. So for a, a very brief moment in time in Kentucky history, nobody was thinking about the Colonel or the Derby. They wanted to see an alien. The family repelled much of a public interest, asking police to please set up barriers and repel the crowds. Glennie herself spent much of the early days following the incident, shooing away curious believers. But eventually, the family decided that they might as well make a quick <laughs> buck off it. As you do, as you always do, eh? Now they charged 50 cents to enter the farm grounds, one dollar to ask for information from the family, and a whopping ten dollars to take a picture of the farm. And that translates to just under a hundred and thirteen dollars in today's money in 2023. Hell yeah. I got that picture of that farmhouse all right. <laughs> Cost a year's wages. Shut up and eat your picture of that farmhouse. <laughs> I guess a journalist might pay it, but I don't think a regular Joe was just like, oh man, I really need a picture of the farmhouse. Soon though, the spotlight began to fade and the public came to ridicule the family. So much that they began to deny the incident ever happened and give up on their claims of the truth. It was just easier to stay silent on the matter. Rapidly, rumours began to spread that an especially potent batch of home-brewed moonshine was the culprit. <laughs> and just ten days after the incident, the family left for home and went their separate ways. What, forever? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. The consensus opinion can be summed up by this quote, highlighted in the Skeptoid article, which is from the Big Book of UFOs. Ooh. The Kelly Hopkinsville case is a classic of UFO literature that has puzzled both believers and debunkers alike. De J. Allen Hynek, the leading UFO researcher of the early days of ufology, said that the Kelly Hopkinsville case seemed preposterous and offensive to common sense. Despite this, the case as a whole is interesting and many investigators consider it a solid example of a close encounter of the third kind. I love that line. Offensive to common sense. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> it's going to make its way into my list of everyday insults. It's beautiful. Sir, that is offensive to common sense. You're going to be saying that to me like <laughs> constantly. <laughs> it's going to be a new t-shirt. I tell you. Oh that. yes, that would be a great sticker. <laughs> you could stick it on things that actually offend you because they're so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're on to a winner here, right? New design on the way. Hell yeah. <laughs> but nothing will ever beat the Mantis is always watching. <laughs> no, 
I love that sticker. I'm putting that everywhere. <laughs> now, you can see that nobody in the mainstream was believing this story of little silver men, but the incident did attract the attention of Project Blue Book, which is a whole nother episode in itself. But briefly, it was the US government study into UFOs from 1952 to 1969. Ooh. Project Blue Book, upon hearing the news, briefly checked in with the US military personnel who had attended the scene that night, but decided not to pursue the matter any further. Huh. Indeed, the story had fallen out of mainstream consciousness until 14 years later when UFO investigators came a knocking and Lucky literally answered the door. Wait, I thought they left. It was a different door. <laughs> oh! But this is how his eight-year-old daughter, <laughs> Gerald. Sorry. Well, it was. It just slayed me. <laughs> I didn't think I had to specify which door it was. It was more of a metaphorical door. I thought they just. But also a literal w- door. I thought they just started to wander the land after the incident, <laughs> and then returned back to the scene of the crime. Oh, we're not Mandalorians. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) So this is actually how his daughter, his eight-year-old daughter, Geraldine, came to find out about his father's extraterrestrial skirmish. Lucky had stayed silent until that point, but he agreed to tell his side of the story, and he took the ufologists to the home with the original door, uh, which had stood (laughs) derelict since the incident. And he guided them through the story, at which point this tale of these goblin invaders began to get integrated with our modern idea of UFO encounters. After all, this tale was later conflated with another Eastern Kentucky report of a woman who had seen a UFO and a six-foot green alien. And when they were combined together, (laughs) that gives us the origin of the phrase, little green men. Ah, I did know that this case is where the term was coined. I didn't know much about this case, but I do know that's where the little green men thing came from, although they weren't green. Now it all makes sense. Okay. But, Lynn, we need to take a look at the theories of what actually happened that night. And I have six theories to present to you. Ooh. But firstly, what do you think? Um, giant bats. Giant bats. Okay. Yeah, but because they didn't have any books, they weren't exactly sure what giant bats looked like. So they just saw it and went, oh, an alien. But actually, it was just a big bat. He was like, you guys have any (laughs) tangerines in there? (laughs) Or whatever they eat. (laughs) (laughs) There's so much wrong with that sentence. I don't know where to start. But okay. Um, Tale as old as time. The first theory, as always, is that it was all real. The family really were attacked by ETs who walked on their arms and repelled bullets. This is the most unlikely answer, and as Occam's razor tells us, the simplest answer is usually the right one. Bulletproof monkeys. (laughs) Oh my god, just wait. Um, (laughs) So... This story is without question far-fetched, and I don't mean the Pokemon, although we will come to Pokemon later on. You better not do anything of the sort to Pokemon, Chris. (laughs) Oh, God. Um, (laughs) The story is far-fetched, but isn't that what we cover on this podcast? There's a reason why we want to hear these stories. However, this story is so explicit that it beggars belief. This is not someone seeing a UFO. It's not someone taking a photograph on a moor. This is quite literally a laser quasar battle with creatures from another world. (laughs) I want to believe, but this is the most unlikely of theories. Next up, as previously mentioned, is Moonshine, a (laughs) home-brewed, bootlegged, clear whiskey. And poorly produced Moonshine can be contaminated with materials used in the production, even leading to lead poisoning with repeated usage. Dangerous ingredients can be used in the production, such as cheap methanol, not designed for consumption, can result in methanol poisoning during production. Some alleged that the family had either created a bad batch of the alcohol or created a batch so strong that it led them 
to delirium. <laughs> I like this theory. They just got so drunk off their tits that they all saw bat aliens and started shooting at the moon. <laughs> now, I mean, it's a, it's a great theory, but there are a few problems with it. The authorities found no evidence of moonshine or any other alcohol. No production equipment was found that night. Glenny Langford was a matriarchal conservative woman. She forbid alcohol in her house and even cussing on the property. So I think we can probably mm. discount that explanation as well. Well, maybe, but you know, those people who uh, protest too much are usually doing the things they're protesting about. So you, you never know with these people. Could have been a true moonshine. I don't know. What do you call it? <laughs> Chemist down in the basement there. <laughs> she is the one who knocks on the any door, but particularly this door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the next theory is shared delusion as a result of MPI or mass psychological illness or epidemic hysteria, or as you may know it from a well-known phrase, mass hysteria. Has that ever been a, a thing in a case? Has that ever been like the prevailing theory that you go, yep, that's definitely what happened? Or is that just a thing we say? See, it's a thing that we say a lot, but there, there is a few cases of it. So just to okay. pop those out there for you, you know, this theory states that for whatever reason, this family shared a psychotic delusion that night. They truly believed what they saw, but what they saw was not real. And this is a real thing. It's generally stress-induced, but it's normally accompanied with a series of symptoms that are not reported by the family in this case, including headaches, nausea, cramps, fatigue, and more. I think my life is a mass delusion. <laughs> <laughs> now, the most famous example of MPI is the Dancing Plague of 1580. Oh, yes, what a classic. The Dancing Plague. So in 1518, a lady in Strasbourg, possibly named Frau Tufol, began to <laughs> dance manically in the street. And soon she was joined by others, <laughs> which was all fine and dandy, except they wouldn't stop until there was possibly up to 400 of them. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what kind of dance? <sighs> Skanking. The Macarena. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this dance epidemic, which in itself sounds like the name of an unreleased ABBA track, <laughs> spread through the region and reportedly resulted in several deaths until it subsided three months later. Three months of dancing? Three months of solid dancing. I don't even think I could do like three minutes of solid dancing. <laughs> <laughs> there was also the laughing epidemic in what we now call Tanzania, which spread from school to school for 18 months straight. So, you know, they must have been listening to dystopian simulation radio. <laughs> I think that's what's happening to me. <laughs> However, this all seems like a little bit too much of a convenient explanation to me, as you noted before. I find it highly unlikely that they all shared the same vision. Uh, the chances of this being the explanation are slim to none. Yeah, I mean, come on. Now, as mentioned before, several of the men worked at a carnival. It's ah. thought that Billy Ray and Lucky were entertainers by trade and knew how to put on a show. And they were the two primary people involved in this encounter as well. Uh, this theory is more likely, but what puts water on this fire is the true terror exuded by the whole family, including Billy and Lucky, as well as the fact that the family rejected all profit and fame from the incident. Yes, they did eventually charge money to enter and photo photograph the site, but only after several days of turning people away. I don't think this family was after fame nor fortune in this tale. But you know, like you said that the house was all derelict and they didn't have much inside of it. It was kind of run down. And they worked at a circus or carnival. So I mean, it kind of makes sense to make, make something up. Like, because if you think about it, right, like, you know, those are the Fiji mermaids and stuff, you know, where they'd They'd take like a, a monkey's upper half and like stick it to the tail of a fish and go, ooh, look mm. at this little creature. Maybe they were like planning to make something like that that they could kind of show off as a thing and charge for. But 
maybe when it came to making the thing, it didn't look very good. So they had to like abort the mission and then just go, oh, we'll charge them for pictures of the house. <laughs> well, possibly, but you'd think they'd want to cash in on that straight away. Yeah, but they couldn't make the thing and they were like, oh, it hasn't gone as planned. The police weren't really in on it and, you know, they didn't mm. find anything and they're coming up with theories. God damn it. Why can't they just believe that the Batmen were at our windows? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the next and probably, in fact, definitely my favourite theory. Some claim that being carnival folk, Lucky and Billy Ray would have easy access to chimpanzees. I freaking knew it. Bulletproof monkey. <laughs> so they borrowed two or three of them from work and dressed them up in silver suits. Aww. They then released the ape, caused a scene themselves through the power of suggestion. I mean, the aliens did move in an ape-like way. There's no evidence to suggest at the carnival the boys worked in even had apes. Mm. This one, I really want to believe, because the idea of them orchestrating this is hilarious. <laughs> but it's almost as unlikely as it being actual aliens. Yeah, and I mean, like, if you've gone to all that effort to scare yourself, wouldn't you at least try and snap a picture of these chimps running off those tinfoil chimps just running into the distance like just because otherwise why who is it for other than yourself who knows that it's fake that's why it's all so weird <laughs> now the final and most likely theory is that these silver men these entities these extraterrestrial aliens were owls ah the old classic <laughs> Yes, Lens, this may be very well what's known as a close encounter of the bird kind. <laughs> You're so silly. <laughs> now, this area of America, and indeed most of North America, are home to the great horned owl. These mm. owls have large yellow eyes, made even larger by the pattern surrounding their eyes. They also share the long ears that the aliens were seen with. They stand at their largest, around three foot tall, which is also the two and a half to three foot tall height reported by the family. Mm. Horned owls are known for being very aggressive, often attacking trainers in captivity unless they've been reared from birth. They will aggressively defend their nests and their young. Now, it has been very overblown in later reports. The family never reported seeing more than two or three of the creatures. It was the media that claimed that up to 12 creatures attacked the home. Oh. And if we look at this case with owls in mind, perhaps when Billy Ray Taylor went to get that drink of water from the well, he stepped onto the owl's territory. Defending its nest, the owl approached him in low light with outstretched wings, mistaken for a hand-raising gesture. This was seen again later in the fight as well. The aliens generally were seen above, on roofs, or in trees, which is where an owl would probably be. The scratching sounds heard on the roof may have been the owl's talons, one of which may have been what grabbed Billy Ray's head from the roof. Oh. This would also explain why the creatures didn't enter the home. Owls can't turn door handles, and why they kept <laughs> popping up at windows, and That's why they were That's what you think. <laughs> and why they were repelled by the light. It also explains that when shot at, they were floated away. I, what they actually did was glide away. Oh. And perhaps the flip of ocean was their way of turning to take off. Now, this theory doesn't explain the metallic ricochet sounds. No. But only four bullet casings were actually found on site, which is a far cry from the boxes of ammunition claimed latterly. Well, this makes a lot more sense because when you are like, they were firing rounds and rounds, I'm like, with a shotgun. And also yeah. like the media report, like over-reporting the amount of creatures in, like why? And then obviously later describing them as green, I guess that's what happened. Yeah. But yeah, I love the owl theory. Uh, it's entirely possible that these four shots happened to miss the owls and hit something metal, exactly. especially as no bodies or blood or alien, or owl, was ever found. Yeah, and just shooting off a shotgun into the darkness, like, you're probably not going to hit your target. It's unlikely. So I think that's a really good theory, actually. And 
owls, like those big owls are really scary looking. Like if you mm. see them in real life up close, they are huge. Let's take a look at a great horned owl. Yep. Mm-hmm. I kind of knew what you were talking about right away, but like when the like close up, these things are really scary. They are. Definitely got the eyes going on and like, yeah, there's no mouth. There's a beak, but not necessarily a nose. So you wouldn't really see that in the dark. And they are kind of, they have a lot of white in the mm-hmm. feather too, which, um, so I was going to say about the silver part, like, how do you explain that? But they do have a lot of white in their feather pattern. It's still quite a stretch. It is still yeah, quite but a stretch. If but... we only have those several theories and you have to pick one. Okay, I'd go with that, but yeah, it definitely doesn't look like the little Batman with the long wings and no feet, but it's the closest thing from the list that you've presented. Mm. It's not perfect, but... This first picture we're looking at, this is it in its typical state. Yeah. But for camouflaging purposes, it can also make itself into a slim boy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love these. (laughs) In its camouflage state, it really does look like a little weird thing. Like, <laughs> but this one has red eyes. How how creepy? Yeah, I mean, you can you can imagine in low light though, you could mistake this for a more humanoid figure. Again, it's still a stretch, but it is more likely <laughs> than what we've it's been seeing. So cute. But have you ever seen what baby owls look like? Um, I have, but I do, I, they're not all the same, I assume. I've seen a bunch of different baby owls. They're just so funny. <laughs> well, take a look at these ones. Yes, I've seen this. I've seen a video of like, they look like little greys. They really do. It's so creepy. <laughs> these are actually um, baby barn owls. These aren't great horned owls. Yeah. It's often reported that on the internet, but they're barn owls. But it does go some way to illustrating how poor lighting can make even the humble bird appear to be something that's come from another world. Yes. And after all, if we remember the immortal words of the giant in the opening of Twin Peaks Season (laughs) 2, the owls are not what they seem. What a lovely note to end on there, Chris. (laughs) Mm. Well, I do have one last note, actually. I did promise you we'd come back to Pokemon. Uh, and Linz, are you familiar with the Pokemon Sableye? M- refresh me. Send me the picture. Oh God, no, no, I do. I do know it now. Is it like purple? It's purple with yes. glistening eyes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so this Pokemon uh, Sableye is based on the aliens in the Kelly Hopkindale encounter in the games, and they're animated with a swaying or wading motion which is based on the creature's reported gait. Wow, yes, that is so cool. I never put that that together before. (laughs) I love that. All these pictures will be up on the Instagram, everyone as well. So um, if you want to see everything that Chris has had me describe to you today, including KFC's follow list, which is amazing. (laughs) They're all at d.s.radio. They certainly are. And if you want to find more, if you want to see the references that I used, if you want further reading, you can find those over on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation radio. But Linz, what are your final thoughts on the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter? Well, first of all, thanks for telling us the story because I, I know of it, but I hadn't looked into it before, much like the Loch Ness Monster, actually. So it's great to actually get the story. So thanks for that. Um, As for theories, I like the owl one, but only if you force me to choose from the list of theories you presented. I really like the chimp one, but it makes no sense to me (laughs) whatsoever. But I think my theory of like um, their house was a bit run down and they needed a a new roof. (laughs) I don't know. And they worked at a carnival and they were like, let's drum up some fame over here and make a little uh, freak show monster. And then they just didn't have the artistic ability when they sobered up from the moonshine. That's my theory. <laughs> but, um, well, I guess. Presumably owls. they used the money they got from 
this to all move out of the house, uh, I'm guessing. Uh-huh. Well, you see, they got something out of it. And they probably needed to move out of that house. So, yeah, I mean, the motivation is there for me. They need to get out of that house or fix that house. That house was probably so run down that it was just like, let's leave it in the dust and go somewhere else. But, um, yeah, I mean, there wasn't any GoFundMes back then, so... You had to be creative, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> the moonshine business wasn't going too well because they didn't have too many neighbors out in the sticks. They're like, this could have worked if we were in the city. But uh, yeah, time to make up some alien boys. Shoot our windows out. <laughs> They're coming right for us. <laughs> What's your theory, Chris? You see, the owl one is very convincing. But at the same time, I do think you have to be a special shade of stupid to mistake owls for aliens or drunk on moonshine yeah i think the most likely thing is a bit of a combination of the few the, 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 the things i think there was probably an owl out there the boys probably disturbed the nest and caused a commotion then the power of suggestion is what caused the entire frenzy and maybe there was an owl on the roof but I don't think that those owls clawing at the doors, I don't think the heads were popping up. I think they were just seeing things where it wasn't. You know when you're like, um, when you're younger and you go ghost hunting with your friends and there's literally nothing there, but you start trying to freak them out by going, what's that? And then everyone starts to panic. And then they just asso- yeah. associate any noise or movement with ghosts. Maybe it's something like that. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I really want to believe this. I always want to believe everything, but uh, it's very rare that we get a case with such overwhelming evidence that we can say, I believe. But I found it very interesting that this is where our origin of the little green men come from. Yes, I like that fact. Uh, and our, our, our shared cultural experience of aliens. And at the time, they were reported widely as goblins as well, because it hadn't quite entered into the cultural zeitgeist yet of, of aliens yeah. following on from goblins. Area 51. Whereas, <laughs> yeah, whereas now we're like, gob- goblins. <laughs> yeah, we're like, that's, that's stupid. That- but aliens, I'm all for that. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening to my story today, Linz. And we would like to uh, ask everybody as well to check out our T Public page, which is going to be in our Instagram bio, or it is tpublic.com forward slash stores forward slash dystopian dash simulation dash radio that is way too long it is but uh, it's the only way <laughs> get yourself a a dsr mug to drink your coffee out of that would be good oh hell yeah <laughs> we've got all sorts of things up there various designs as we talked about go and have a look uh you can get t-shirts you can get mugs bags uh stickers all sorts of things go along and have a look every single penny supports us goes back in to the podcast to the hosting to everything else so if you want to show your appreciation order a t-shirt show it with your money (laughs) is that what you're saying chris (laughs) (laughs) put your money where your ears are (laughs) but no we appreciate all of you guys and it's so fun interacting with you on instagram and everything so thanks so much for sticking around and chatting with us on there and sending us all kinds of weird reels and cases that you come across. It's always fun. <laughs> we do. We love it. And as I said, this, uh, this episode itself was inspired by a listener suggestion. Thanks again to Ellie Bergen. And if you have a listener suggestion you'd like us to look into, fire us an Instagram message or a Patreon message, and we will do a little bit of investigation, see if there's enough meat on the bone to do one of these episodes yeah and i'm often sending voice notes on, in the instagram dms so uh we look forward to that <laughs> so until next time watch out remember the owls are not what they seem mm, and the mantis and is always watching <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time on dystopian simulation radio bye bye now
like though? What do you think they sound like? Um. Hello, my name's Jeff, and I'm an alien. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. Hello, my name's Jeff. Oh, that's Jeff the Mongoose. Oh, true. 